controlling the price of money, probably the most essential commodity in human relationships. Well, actually, we think that the markets, those markets have been bottoming, trying to bottom, meaning putting in a base, seeing accumulation for, over the last, since uh, July, actually. Okay. Uh, and they keep, you know, they, they, they have fitful rallies that seem to fail and then they go back down and it just frustrates everybody who's in those markets. But actually, we define the, the action, if you look at it like a GDX chart or a silver chart or a gold chart, uh, since July as accumulation. Meaning, yes, we came down fairly sharply from the March highs early this year, which was people buying war news, you know, which is you, you don't do that in gold. Gold has bigger reasons to go up and down than the Ukraine situation. Um, so you had a sharp drop from the March high. But if you'll notice, starting in July, the tone of all those the weakness in those markets slowed dramatically to the point where it entered a range in some cases. Uh, we call that an accumulation range. It's where smart money buys weakness, as opposed to chasing strength, okay? <laughs> which is really the better way to approach markets after all. Uh, so I think that we're about to emerge from that accumulation base. I think yesterday's action in particular, which was so negative looking, overtly anyway, on Newmont and Barrick Gold, the two biggest blue chip gold miners, they had a similar, what you call accumulation range since July. You know, where basically if you sold them in July, you didn't make any money, you know, sideways to gradual down. So you're getting sort of frustrated. But then yesterday they collapsed, both of them. In fact, the entire gold sector did not do that. It was just those two major blue chip stocks, which is very interesting. And they had a very sharp dropout through the bottom of the accumulation range. Now, a lot of people would consider that a resumed downside. However, it's our experience, whenever you've seen an old trend, one that's lasted a year or two or three, in this case, more than two years from the summer of 2020 high, okay, been under, under gradual pressure, and in particular, this, this spring and summer, sharp pressure in the miners especially. And then you see an accumulation range or a rectangle of action. Somebody's saying, hey, you know, I don't care how bad this looks, I'm buying it. Okay. And then when you get a downside breakout through the bottom of that, be very careful in your assumption that that's some kind of negative resumption. I think that the monetary metals have an historic role. They always have. And that is to retain inherent value, okay? regardless of destruction of the money unit, meaning the inflation and the quantity of the money units. And over the, since 1959, the M2 has grown up almost about 90 to 100 percent every decade in terms of quantity of money. Okay. Especially since early 2020, it really skyrocketed. Now, it's flattened lately, but don't look at it month to month. Look at it more broadly. But if you look at the money supply growth since, let's go back to when gold, early 1970s. So let's go back 50 years. M2 has grown 20-fold. Gold has grown 20-fold. Get the point? <laughs> it, it protects assets. Uh, and I think that it knows. And I'm, I'm not the only one to have said, we said this early in the year. Now, I, uh, yesterday, two, three days ago on, on Bloomberg, Nouriel Rubini, who's a private analyst, uh, a fundamental analyst, has come to the conclusion that, that the downside in paper assets, especially stock market, due to what the Fed has been doing and what they did before, which they're now undoing, uh, namely inflate paper assets. And now suddenly when they try to deflate inflation, they are. But the inflation they're deflating is paper asset inflation. That it's going to get so out of hand that there won't be a historic comparison. And I fully agree with that. If you go back and look at the 1929 bull market, I think it was from 1923, 24 lows up to 1929. Go back and look at the 2000 so-called dot-com bubble. Go back to 1994, look at the lows then to 2000. Go back and look at the bear market lows in 2002 in the S&P and then the high in 2007 prior to that real estate. Those advances were doubles and quadruples at, at most in terms of from bear low to bull high in the stock market. And all during those times, the Fed was definitely pumping money for various excuses and reasons, including in the 1920s. This time, it's a sevenfold increase in the S&P 500 from its 2009 low to the 2021 high. And for the NASDAQ 100, the leader index, it was a 16-fold bubble. 
when these guys come undone and we think they're undone, the unraveling of those excesses will be equal and opposite and very destructive to not only the valuations of those assets, but to people's lives. Uh, I saw on TV the other day, they were talking to some middle-aged, middle-class income earner who said, I wasn't able to add to my 401k this year. I needed the money to just pay bills. What they didn't mention is if he had money in stocks or bonds, he not only didn't add money this year, he lost 20 to 30% of what was in his retirement account. So personal pain is going to come from this. And thank you, central banks, for having created this kind of reality. But ultimately, when that reality unfolds, and it's already in, in the minds of many major central banks, by the way, we've had more gold buying by central banks since the late 1960s over just the last quarter or two incredible amount of, bank, uh, not us, not the U.S., but other governments around the world accumulating tons, sometimes hundreds of tons of gold. Why? They fear what's coming and they're justified. When you have a central bank, and this is a problem with both political parties, by the way, you know, the Republicans claim to be conservative. They don't like government intrusion. But on the other hand, they, they don't object to the Federal Reserve. Well, the Federal Reserve is like this. What if you had a government agency that said, OK, we're going to dictate the price of beef? Monopoly control over the price of beef to protect the citizens, okay? Sounds like Russia in the 1980s, okay? We don't do that, okay? The, if, if that if the U.S. government tried to do that, the Republicans would object. But they don't object to the Federal Reserve controlling the price of money. Probably the most essential commodity in human relationships is our monetary ability to exchange with one another. And if they control the price of that, meaning interest rates, then how are we supposed, you know, free markets determine prices better than anything. Buyers, sellers, it works. Things change, prices change, demand and supply change. It adapts to reality. But when you have a, a body of wise men or women from above, people who've never even run a business, okay, telling the world, telling the country what the cost of money is, then if they're wrong, we all suffer the error. It's not just an error committed by one company making a product that nobody wants. You know, they, they go out of business. Fine. Okay, that's the way markets work. But when a central bank with coercive power, after all, they do have the legality of government to enforce their rules, tell us what the price of money is supposed to be. If they make a mistake, we all suffer from their mistake. Well, for a dozen years, they printed money like crazy. They did QEs. Monetary expansion went berserk. Interest rates were effectively zero, effectively zero. Well, what kind of economic distortions can come from that? I mean, you as a businessman or a, 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 a local government, whatever, making decisions out a year, two and three. One of the factors in your decision process is what's the cost of money? You know, how much do we commit because what's the cost of money? Well, if, if all of a sudden you're given money like a drug in an arm free, then your, your assumptions based on the price of money are totally false. Because if that should change back to reality, where money actually costs something, you know. And so the Fed now has done their reversal. The problem is their pin pricking is not going to prick the Bloomberg Commodity Index. In fact, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is up about 20% on the year right now. S&P is down about 25% on the year. NASDAQ down 30% plus on the year. Bonds down an enormous amount. So the, the bubble they've broken is the inflation distortion of prices that flowed into paper assets for a dozen years. And so when those errors reveal themselves, and I don't just mean the broader errors, but the more specific errors, uh, the biggest bubble in US stock market history and paper asset history is coming undone. I think I conclude, and I have for a while, that silver's gonna vastly outperform gold on this upside. It usually does, by the way, in bull trends, silver beats gold by handfuls in terms of percent gain. In downside, it beats it as well, the other way. And recently we've seen that. But when that reverses, expect silver to outpace gold. And I think the silver miners are highly likely to outpace the gold miners. We're going to delve into the silver miners in the next week or so and try to hand pick some of the miners within the, in the category to see which one, ones look the best. But as far as the upside goes, uh, we come out with numbers and we adjust them weekly because sometimes the numbers will adjust based on a moving average that might change week to week. But gold has a number. One, we've already crossed today. Um, it, it's a 200-day average oscillator structure. It's not the 200-day average itself. It's the momentum structure that is built. But when you plot 
gold in relation to the 200-day average, which is pretty long average, like three quarters of a year. Okay, You've crossed that today. You've broken out. And that goes back uh, to March. That trend is broken out above. But there's another number about a half percent above today's high. If you close a week out above it, monthly momentum says, I'm out of here. Okay, So that's the only number we've got waiting. Um, silver's already done comparable breakouts. It's been waiting on gold. Though. Gold's been the laggard. It's the mama market, though. So you have to pay attention to mama. Uh, it may be slower than the others, but it's the one that ultimately determines the game. So, uh, but we think the action we've just seen the last few days, namely the downside followed by the abrupt upside, is uh, probably the turning point. 